now I'm passing to our last speaker, to our special guest, Dr. Richard Falk. I know you've all been waiting for him to, to take the floor. And we are very glad to have, have him here. And before you start, I would first like to express really our support for your great work and the important and difficult mission that you have in this in, in this field, we, we highly appreciate your, your effort and I think we should encourage him to, to continue his, his work the way he's doing now. Well, just to introduce him very briefly, I'm sh sure most of you know him. So he's Professor Emeritus of International Law at the Princeton University and Project Director of Global Climate Change, Human Security and Democracy University of California. He was a leading academic voice against the Vietnam War and he was also very engaged in the outlawing of nuclear weapons. In 2008 he was appointed UN special, Nations Special Reporter on the situation of human rights on Palestinian territories occupied since, since 1967. So thank you very much Dr. Jeffrey for being here with us. You have the floor. Uh, thank you Daniela. And, um, let me say it, uh, I feel honored and humbled uh, by uh, being on this uh, panel. Uh, uh, someone who spoke as uh, Issa Lambo did about the rea daily realities of resisting occupation it has genuine courage. It's, uh, uh, makes me feel, as I say, very humble in his presence because he really confronts uh, the uh, ugliness of what uh, has been imposed upon uh, the Palestinian people. And what is true for Hebron is so important because it's the extreme that exemplifies the entire occupation. It, it, it is a, uh, it, in one sense, it is more uh, severe, the situation there is more severe and more exaggerated, but it isn't different in uh, quality from what the people throughout uh, occupied Palestine have been experiencing for 46 years. And you have the notion of an, what is called an occupation extending for that length of time. It is something that is, our, our political and moral imagination cannot absorb that. It, it, to, to have uh, children born into occupation and die in occupation it is something uh, beyond the horizon of our capacity for uh, uh, comprehension. And so it's very valuable to have that kind of uh, witnessing that he has brought to our own uh, experience. And likewise, uh, my colleague on my right here has uh, brought a very neglected perspective uh, to the uh, general discussion of the Palestinian ordeal, which is to make us aware that it's not only a territorial problem, that it is a problem of people, above all, and that the refugee issue cannot be brushed aside as a uh, kind of inconvenient, uh, uh, inc inconvenient and incidental aspect of the essential issue, which is land for peace which is an effort to territorialize uh, the conflict. And as he points out, to have a diaspora of seven million people, uh, which is approximately uh, 
double the number of people living under occupation, number of Palestinians living under occupations, uh, it gives some sense of how the international community has uh, distorted the perception of the issue. Uh, and so it's, uh, what his work, I think, is uh, invaluable in allowing us to have a fuller uh, understanding of why the tragedy, the Palestinian tragedy, is more than the tragedy of occupation. And as, again, as he points out, and I'm just trying to uh, uh, underscore the importance of it, not only have the Palestinians suffered from uh, expulsion from their land of historic residence, but they've suffered cumulative tragedies as being the scapegoat of choice in these uh, countries that have experienced instability of one kind or another, and he mentioned Kuwait and Iraq and now Syria. Also Jordan, of course, uh, at an earlier time, and Lebanon. So that it uh, is unprecedented in uh, historical experience that a people would be expelled from their own land and then uh, have these uh, double, triple, quadruple tragedies uh, added to that initial uh, Nakba experience. Uh, let me speak uh, myself very briefly uh, against this background that has been so well uh, presented to us and visually as well as uh, verbally, uh, which, which I would summarize as, uh, uh, in, with one phrase, the cruelty of geopolitics has now for decades victimized the Palestinian people. <coughs> and uh, that, what, what I mean by that is that it is the international, the failure of the international community uh, to have tolerated this uh, terrible sequence of developments, despite the fact that uniquely in relation to the whole decolonization process had a historic responsibility uh, inheriting Palestine from the British mandate. And the British mandate, of course, uh, uh, generating this problem to begin with uh, by the Balfour Declaration as if the uh, self-determination of the Palestinian people could be decided in the British Foreign Office, you know, which was a huge colonialist uh, uh, act of arrogance. And even the UN Partition Agreement of, uh, of uh, 1947 that fragmented uh, historic Palestine was again a huge the arrogant act that, uh, pre that thought that the f uh, destiny of the Palestinian people could be determined uh, outside, by, by others than themselves, it, it contradicted, in other words, the fundamental ethos of self-determination, which was the foundation of decolonization the foundational norm of decolonization and is incorporated as the Article I of the two human rights covenants. And the opposite of self-determination is imperialism or settler colonialism. Uh, and it's, it's really that tension <coughs> Uh, that is at the core of the conflict as it has uh, unfolded over the decades now. And this issue is the symbolic moral 
uh, challenge to the international community at, at this time. It had been uh, previously, I think, uh, the racist apartheid regime of South Africa that was the sort of litmus test of uh, uh, human solidarity. And now I think the Palestinian struggle has uh, emerged as the successor to that, and the people of uh, the people who uh, grasp an identity, a human identity, that extends beyond their own uh, accidents of national affiliation, are drawn to this issue as the most important symbolic site of struggle that is presently uh, engaging uh, those who care about uh, human rights in a uh, existential way, not as an abstraction, but as something that uh, affects our lives uh, even if it seems uh, geographically uh, remote. And one of the uh, uh, disservices that the global media has performed is to keep this conflict uh, remote, and, uh, and particularly to keep uh, the kinds of daily ordeals that were described uh, so vividly for us uh, out of our uh, field of uh, conscious uh, consciousness, unless we make a special effort. We have to make a special effort uh, to uh, find this, uh, to, have to, to grasp the depth of uh, the uh, uh, suffering and ordeal that this uh, uh, humanitarian, political, and social catastrophe has produced uh, ever since uh, 1948, and really ever since 1917, depending on how one characterizes. And uh, what is also uh, uh, <laughs> here in this <coughs> setting is that a occupation that goes on this long has the features of becoming a new permanent reality. And Israel from the beginning, in my view, never conceived of this occupation as temporary or as something that would be uh, reversed, and it has played a mind game with the international community by uh, talking about uh, some kind of two-state uh, solution. Its own linguistic discourse internally has confirmed that, referring to not the it only refers to the occupied territory when it's talking internationally. Internally, it always uses the language of uh, Judea and Samaria. And it talks not about Palestinians, it talks about Arabs. It tries to externalize the, uh, on the one level, it's trying to uh, make the point that the video clip, that this land is really ours, biblically, uh, militarily, economically, in every way. It's trying to make that point, and at the same time it's trying to say there, it's, it really is the legacy of that famous remark of uh, Golda Meir, there are no Palestinians. Who are the Palestinians? So it, and it's really trying to uh, denationalize the Palestinian identity by uh, describing them, uh, by describing the people resident in Palestine as Arabs, not as Palestinians. And therefore, they don't really belong in Palestine. They belong in an Arab. And if you talk to many Israelis, that's what they'll tell you. They're 22 Arab 
uh, countries. Uh, why do, uh, we're a little, the only Jewish country in the region. Why shouldn't uh, uh, the Arab countries absorb? Uh, they, they want to keep the refugees as a uh, issue. You know, it's a it's a kind of perverse uh, reading of the uh, refugee problem. Uh, so, what prolonged occupation really has uh, transformed itself into is creeping annexation, apartheid regime the consolidation of settler colonial ambitions, and a, uh, a permanent uh, set of realities that are not at all accommodated within either human rights law or international uh, humanitarian law. There is no protection, which is the theme, I think, of the two uh, prior uh, presentations. So let me end by saying that I think this is a reality that has short-term and longer-term uh, challenges confronting all of us in the international community. The short-term challenge is to uh, make sure that the situation doesn't get worse by uh, failing to fund uh, the operations that are necessary for the subsistence of the Palestinian people. And of course the long-term uh, legitimacy war that is being waged uh, globally through a solidarity <coughs> movement and uh, territorially by Palestinian resistance in various forms is something that I think eventually uh, will vindicate the cause of justice that has been so long denied in relation to the Palestinian people. Thank you for your attention. Let me stop there. Welcome.